It is good to see you today. We are so glad to have you. If you're visiting today and I didn't get a chance to greet you, I apologize about that. But if you're visiting, take time to fill out a visitor's card. Let us know you're here. We want to tell you thank you in a special way. We've got a little gift for you. You fill out that card with one of those lovely Life Church at South Mountain pens. You can keep the pen. And we'll give you that as your lovely gift. We are so glad to have you today. And I'm glad if it's your first time, we hope you feel welcome. We hope you feel like you're a part of, of us just worshiping God. You see, we're not, we're not any, we're not separate in this, we're together in this. We are one body serving a glorious and great God. And we are together in so many different ways. We have... Things. I know if it's your first time here, just so we're so glad to have you. But we, I, I got a, a text from Laura last night, and I hope Laura doesn't mind me saying this. Um, Manny, I'm going to ask you to do something for me right now. Uh, I want you to take the microphone and let Laura come up here for a minute. She's going to be totally embarrassed, but I want you to translate. Manny goes, what? He's never done this before. <laughs> Laura, I want you to come up here. Laura sent me a text last night. Some friends of hers. Thank you. Jamie's thrilled for you. <laughs> she sent me a text last night. Come on up here. I know she don't like to be up here, but um, I, I, she sent me a text and, it, and, it, and, it, and I, I was just sitting there thinking about it. And I haven't let, stopped thinking about it since you sent it to me. But uh, part of it was that you had some friends coming from Mexico. And they came because we had, they had seen God do a miracle in our prayer services. Amen. Uh, remember, how many of you remember when we, were, we sent a prayer around and we were praying for Reuben? Anybody remember when we were praying for Reuben? Reuben received a miracle. The doctors didn't think he would recover. They didn't think he would ever be able to live through an accident that he had had. But God miraculously healed him. And he is doing good now, right? Yes. He's doing good. He is doing good. And, and God has healed him. And they're, they're, God is, is working in their family. They've seen God work in our church. They've seen God. And they wanted to come to church here so that we can pray over a need that they have. And we're going to pray over that need. Uh, but at the end of service, I'm going to anoint you with, with oil. And I'm going to believe God to do that miracle. But here's what I want to, to tell you what Laura said. And this is my, my, and Manny, I hope you can translate this so that they can hear what you're saying. But she sent me the text and she said, Pastor, I don't know how to, to deal with this. They were so excited to leave Mexico and drive eight hours to be at church with us on Sunday morning. And sometimes I complain because I have to drive 45 minutes to church. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. When you get hungry for a touch from God, distance won't matter. Situations won't matter. Because when you get hungry for God to do a miracle, God will show up to do a miracle. Amen. How many of you believe that with me today? Amen. Thank you for telling people about God's work, Laura. Thank you. Amen. I believe God is still working in a mighty way in our church. So many things that God is doing. Today is a, is a day that, and I told Laura, I said, wow, of all days, we're doing something special today. We're, we're going to be praying over the kids here in just a little bit. It's back to school time. All you parents should be cheering like, with all enthusiasm that you can celebrate with. Those kids who have been driving you crazy all summer, who have been literally going crazy with, with eating you out of house and home, you get to send them back and let the teachers deal with them, right? Now can you enthusiastically say, yay, all right. You know, we're so excited. To, the, the kids are, are, are getting back to school. Some of them are, are moving up. We call this Promotion Sunday. And what that basically is, is a lot of the kids that have gone through our Sunday school program, some of them are moving up. They're in children's church right now, and they're going to be coming in in just a little bit uh, later. And all of the kids that are in children's church and some that are in the preschool, they're going to be coming in. We're going to have prayer over all of the kids up front in the church. And we're going to pray over each one of them. And we're going to believe God for the touch to protect them and to provide for them this next school year. I don't know about you. But um, with all that's going on in the world today, I, I, I sometimes, my son Joey, and he, I know he didn't want me to say anything, but yesterday he got his driver's license. 
and, and he's driving, and he, he's all excited about it, and all I can do, Don, is sit and pray. Um, you've been there. You've done that. I've done that a few times. My youngest now of all of my five kids is now driving, and he, is, and he looked at me, Dad, and he said, Now, freedom. I said, no, now a job. So, <laughs> but, uh, but he is, and as I was looking at him, I thought about that. With all that's the chaos that's going on in the world, with uh, the shootings that, that, and things that are happening, when you can't even go to Walmart and feel comfortable, you, when you can't go to, to, to a movie or you can't go to, uh, you know, to a ball game without being suspicious of it, we, we were, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, the world that we live in. And our kids, we send them off to face a future that doesn't look very positive to, to some. You know, I had one kid tell me the other day, I said, what are you going to be when you grow up? He said, no, if I grow up. And when he said that, I never thought about that when I was a kid, because all I thought about was growing up. I'm still working on it too, by the way, but... When he looked at me and said that, I, all I could think of was, what a tragedy that a child, with all of its future ahead of it, would say, if I grow up. Because we're not promised to even believe it or not, the next breath that we breathe. And so when our kids pack up and go to school, and we put them on the bus, or we walk them to school, and they, and they go to school, hug them hard before you leave them. When you say goodbye, tell them you love them. Make sure you mean it. Make sure they know you mean it. And then finally, I think that one of the things that we need to understand is that this is not the way that you say goodbye. Because sometimes when we say goodbye, we think, well, it's just a, I'm glad you're out of here. But this could be the last time that you'll see that child. Because when they go to school nowadays, we're not promised the next breath that we breathe. And the future seems awful difficult with craziness of people breaking into school. When, when you have to have this, the idea of possibly putting security now when you can't walk into a, a, a school now without being scanned for a weapon, we live in an awful unsafe world. And we need to pray as never before for the future of our world. The Bible tells us that from generation to generation, we would pass on these things. There are so many things that I want to say today, but I, I felt very important to prepare you as I, as I share this word. And to some, this might be a, a simple message, but to some, I, I've got grandkids that are going to school. And my grandbaby, Paisley, this is her first year of school, and she sent me her um, pictures of of her first day at school with her school outfit on and her, her uh, attire and she was looking at it and she was smiling from ear to ear and I said are you scared and she said nope I'm already smarter than the teacher <laughs> I told her I said where did you hear that and I, she said Papa you told me that the other day that I was smarter than the teacher so I might have gotten her in trouble with that comment but I wanted to preach today a little bit about this word of training up our child as we prepare them for school. My scripture text is very simple, and most of you know it. It's in Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, verse 6. If you have a child and you have one that has grown up in your home, you've probably quoted this scripture, you probably know this scripture, but the basis of it simply says the proverb that gives us hope and, and gives us hope for our children and gives us hope for our future. It says when you train up a child in the way that he or she should go, when he or she is old, they will not depart from it. When you train up a child in the way that he or she should go, when they're old, they will not depart from it. I wanted to talk this way because I felt like 
We've oftentimes said that I've held on to that promise for some of my children that have gone astray and wandered that way. And I hold on to the fact that we've planted seeds in their life. They've been to church. They've grown up in church, but they've wandered away and they've they've went the way of the world and the world has tried to steal them. But but I hold on to that promise that God will not let them go astray, that God will bring them back to where they need to be, that somehow that message will reverberate in their life that they need to know Jesus Christ and they need to know them personally. As I prayed that prayer and I've said that verse and I've quoted it many times as my, in my prayers over my kids, Lord, I did my best to train them up. I did my best to, to bring them up in a knowledge of your word. I did my best to, to bring them up and I said, Lord, I declare your word that they will not depart from it. I know that I've talked to many of you. Many of you are like me with your grandchildren and your children. And, and perhaps the devil has tried to steal them away. But when we hold on to this promise, we will hear the words of God speak volumes to us. If you have children at home today, I want this message. I want you to write down some things. On the back of your page, on your bulletin there, is a place to write some notes. You may want to write some of these down. And I want you to make sure that you remember this and you remind this uh, to everyone that you know that's got children, either grandchildren or children that are heading to school. They need to hear this message as they prepare for school in the world, the crazy world that we live in. You see, I, I want to look at it this way. This idea of training up a child... That, I, that word to train up is, is a phrase that we see in Scripture and it means to, to, to teach or to guide one in life's lessons. Now, life is hard enough and life in itself is difficult enough to figure it out. We live in a crazy world when kids are... When, when I was, was younger, probably I didn't have to face a lot of the decisions of, of what the kids are facing today. You see, I didn't have to... Uh, um, write on an application whether I was a male or a female or, or, or I had a choice of other. I, I, that wasn't given to me. And I thank the Lord. Listen, here, I'm not bashing anyone, but I will tell you this. You were born and the doctor declared you were a male or a female and that's what you are. But kids are confused today. About male and female, man and woman, and, 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 and well, I, I choose to be this, or I choose to be this, or I want to be this, and, 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 and all kinds of options race in the minds of children. They're confused in their mind of, of what's happening. They're, they're fear because of, the, of what could happen at school. Uh, some of them, we went through this phase of the bullying stage, and when people were, 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 they would run around and they would try to bully someone. And I, I was never big enough to be a bully. I was usually the one that the bullies targeted because I was short, but I was mean. You know, dynamite is in small packages, Phil. And, 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 and when I thought about the, the idea of, of, of being bullied, I didn't have to worry about that much. It wasn't that. You, you see, I went to a country school, a small school, and, and, and I was... Uh, uh, Basically, one of the I've always been one of the shortest in my. If I tell you what, Daryl, if you want to see my school pictures in any of my yearbooks, you can always find me. I'm usually in the front row, right in the middle, because that's where they put the shortest person. And I had glasses most of my life, so you could pick me out about any crowd. And when I was there, and then you look through that and the identification of it, it would be a target. But I can tell you this: I'm glad. And I don't want to go back, and I don't want to do my school years over again. I know somebody said, oh, if I could just start over again, why would you want to do that? You have made it through those days. Move on. But don't hurry up and try to get through them, kids. Enjoy them. Some of the best days and times of my life were when I was growing up in school. You see, I, I can remember a few things about my childhood but most of my childhood was wrapped up in church. Most of my childhood was the training that I got from my Sunday school teachers. When I was disciplined in, uh, Don, it, it, I can remember growing up when discipline was not uncommon, even by your Sunday school teacher. I remember one time, I, we had Sunday school in a small church, and we had church in a house. And they had a two-story house, 
and the church was downstairs and we had service in the living room. We'd clear out all the chairs and all the furniture and we would put our rows in there and we would have church downstairs and our Sunday school rooms were upstairs in the bedrooms. And we were able to have bedroom, a Sunday school in the boys' room. And I can still remember Sister Wilson. Uh, she was our, our pastor's wife, but she was also my Sunday school teacher because she, we, she was the only one that could, would, would bear to deal with us five or six boys that were rotten to the core. Not a girl in the bunch. All of us were boys. But I couldn't sit still at that age. And I had the fidgets one Sunday morning, and I kept bouncing on the bed. And I was told several times by Sister Wilson to stop bouncing on the bed. And when I bounced one time too many, she looked over at me and she spanked me. And I, my eyes were about as big as quarters. And I thought, what in the world is this? And she said, Mr. Pratt, I want to tell you what you're going to do. From now on, you're not going to get to sit on the bed. You're going to sit on the floor. Do you know that the rest of that time that I was in her Sunday school class, I never bounced once. But I grew up with that kind of influence and fluctuation of, of my life was given around church. And some of you grew up in church. And, and I was trained in the, in the mannerisms of what church is all about. But I want to talk to you this morning a little bit about today's world where we don't get the opportunity to see our kids growing up in church and they're not always trained in the, the mannerisms of church. They're given the, the secular world trains them. I want to pull that up. Go ahead and, 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 and pull up that scripture that says who will train our children. I believe it's the next slide, Robert. Go ahead. Who will train them? I know that not too long ago, uh, Hillary Clinton wrote a book, It Takes a Village to Raise a Family or Raise a Child. And I, I know that sometimes it does take a village. It does take a group of people. But here's what we a lot of times think about who will train our children. The first one, start, let's start with number six. It says, who will train our child? It says, the world will train them. And then the, the peers will train them. The school will train them. Finally, the church, we want to train them. The extended family will help out. And then the last one would be the parents. If you reverse that role and you take it in the nature of which we given, a lot of times we forget that the responsibility that God had, uh, God said was the parents are the first ones to train your child. You are the number one influencer in your child's life. It should not be the school is the number one influencer or their friends are the number one influencer. But that will be exactly what happens in their life. As they mature and as they grow, their parents become the, the predominant one. When they're born, a baby looks to their mother and father. And as they grow up, that's who they look for. Anytime they're in a crowd or in a, in a room, as they grow up, they begin to look for mom and dad. When a child looks for that person, as they get a little bit older, they begin to look for their extended family, their aunts and their uncles. They look for a familiar face, if you will. They look for somebody they know. You move on down and, and we see that they I, I know when I was growing up, Don, and, and when I grew up in the church, I knew everybody in the church as brother and sister so and so. If they were taller than me, they were brother so and so. I didn't I didn't call anybody by their first name. I wasn't allowed to do that. My dad said, you will respect them and you will call them brother so-and-so, whoever their last name was. I remember Brother Poole all my life. He was a Sunday school teacher. He was tall and bald-headed. I, I like the way he looked now. <laughs> but uh, Brother Poole, I can still remember he was tall. And, of course, I was only about two foot nothing when I was growing up. And so everybody was tall. And, but I can still remember him. And he would always pat me on the top of the head. And he said, Greg Pratt, it's good to see you in church this morning. And I would think, well, Brother Poole, I had no choice. <laughs> you see, I was drugged at church. I was drugged to church every Sunday morning. My parents would throw me in the car and I was drugged to church. Anytime the church was open, I was drugged to church. Kicking and screaming sometimes, but I was taken to church. My parents loved to, to go to church anytime the church doors were open. And, and so the church became a familiar part of my life. As a matter of fact, some days I would know the church more than I would my school. But then when I started school, I began to, I can, I can still remember, Don, the first day of kindergarten. How many of you remember your first day of kindergarten? I do. It was very traumatic for me. I will tell you this. My mom 
some of you have heard this story, but my mom, as loving, and, and, and Ben, I'm sure she's watching this as we live stream this service, but my mom pulled up in front of the school, and I was there, and, and she was almost in tears, and she said, I, I, she got ready to stop and get me out of the car, and she opened up the, the door, and she said, I'll come around and get you, and I said, Mom, I'm in kindergarten now. I can do it myself. And of course, everybody that knows my mom knows I was running late. Everybody else was already in the classroom. The door was shut. And so I walked up to the door and, and I got all the way to the door. Now, you guys will like this part. When I reached up to grab the handle, I looked back at my mom and I could see her. She was just watching me all the way up there. And I went to push the button and I couldn't. My, I was too short to open the, the handle of the door. And I just stood there and pulled on it and I looked around at my mom and tears started running down my face and tears started running down her face and the teacher heard me pulling on the door and let me tell you something, when you're a kindergarten, that's very traumatic for you. I thought about quitting school right then and there, but I went on, I finished. But, but I remember school, it became a part of my life and it was a great influencer. I, I like to be around my friends, I like to go to school, I like, to, to, I like the athletics, and I was involved in sports, and I, I love that side of school, I, I love being there, and, and uh, when I was going to school, it, we didn't have all the groups that we do now in school, and, 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 and it, was, it, it, didn't, it wasn't separated like it is now, but you have to almost belong to a group or a gang, if you will, not really a gang, but a group, you, 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 you're that way, right? I mean, you, you, you're either, the, I mean, there's skaters and all these other things. I mean, you're, you're this or you're that. I mean, I don't know. Your school probably didn't have any of those, does it? No. Oh, cool guys. They, they always know that. So, no. But, no I mean, all, these, all of the different places you go to school and sometimes you fit in and sometimes you didn't. And I, would, I was the type that, you know, I, I, I just did my own thing. I was, I was I was a football player. I, was, I, I did my thing, and I went to school. I ran track, and, and so I had all that wrapped up, and I, I enjoyed school. I was one of those weird kids that liked school. Now, I was never good at school. I couldn't read very well, and I struggled with reading, and I made a joke of it all the time. I was kind of the class jokester. I was the funny guy all the time. When, when the teacher would say, read this, and I would stutter and stammer and I didn't read very well because I found out when I was going into college in my entry exam that I had dyslexia but I bluffed my way through high school and and made my way all the way through high school and was able to get into college when I got into college that's when they found out that I had dyslexia and, it, and all of that being said is that school could have been I could have been negative about it but school was an important part of my life but do you realize right now that kids are being taught all kinds of things I mean, it, it used to be that high school was when you learned about sex education. And, and, and they were, you know, very strict about how they taught it and who taught it and what was said when I was in school. And I remember that my son Joe brought a paper home when he was in fifth grade. And they asked for permission to have a sex talk with him in fifth grade. Yeah, crazy world, isn't it? Did you know that right now the average child that, that goes to a public school is faced with some kind of knowledge of drugs in the age of third and fourth grades? I, I, the world has changed and school has changed and our kids have been forced to change. We can protect them all we want to and we can say that, that this is not going to happen to my child but it comes through the TV, it comes through the programs, it comes through all kinds of programs, and they're feeding all this into our, our, our children as they grow up. So when we train up a child, we look at the, the school system, we look at their peers, and of course, they, they gravitate to whoever and whatever, and, and they'll have friends at the church, they'll have friends at the school. Even if you homeschool your children, they will be influenced by the kids that they play with in the playground or around their home. And then they gravitate to the world as it trains them. It's a difficult place for our children to face. So how do we train our children in such a crazy world? 
I pulled this up off the internet. It says, if we don't teach our children to follow Christ, the world will teach them not to. And that's as true a statement as I've ever heard. If we don't teach them to follow Christ, the world will teach them not to follow him. And when we look at that, we begin to see it. So how do we train our children? How do we do this? The first thing that I want to say is this. We must get involved in their lives. I'll try to move as quickly as I can in the next few minutes, but I want you to write these down. We must be involved in their lives. We must be their number one fan. We must be their number one fan. If you have children, you need to cheer them on and you need to be as proud as you can of them. I've told you about my mom. The first year that I wrestled in high school, I was in eighth grade, and they moved me up to wrestle in the, on the varsity team in, in ninth grade, and I was wrestling, and I remember getting in my, my wrestling uniform in my first match. I was there, and, and this kid looked like he was like uh, about almost twice my size. I was wrestling the smallest weight that they had because nobody else could make light a weight. I, again, I was in living in a farm country, and everybody was pretty hefty, and I was the scrawny one of the bunch. And so they saw me at practice in eighth grade, and they said, do you want to wrestle in high school? Man, my eyes lit up. I said, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And I got my uniform on, and I remember walking out on that mat the first time, and I must have really looked afraid because that guy, he, he, I mean, he, could all, he looked like he was, could shave. <laughs> I'm walking out on the mat. Here this guy is, he's got muscles on top of muscles, and I'm nothing but a stick. Wow, <laughs> those days are a long way away. But uh, I, w I remember walking out there, and they said, shake hands, we shook hands, and all of a sudden, we started wrestling around the floor, and I hadn't, I mean, I'd pra practiced, I'd been wrestling since I was in sixth grade, so I knew enough about wrestling, but all of a sudden, that guy started thrashing me around. I was small, and he just beat me down. And I remember he had turned me over and he was twisting me up and he had me getting ready to pin and the, the referee was looking at my shoulder, counting down and, and all of a sudden you could hear the crowd roaring for this kid that was about to pin me and all I could hear was my mom saying, don't hurt my baby. <laughs> every wrestling match, I could hear my mom yell over everybody in the crowd. She didn't yell that all the time, but because when I went home, I said, Mom, please don't tell everybody that I'm getting hurt. But <laughs> I can remember when I was a kid and we went to baseball games and my dad used to tell me, son, you can be the you can be a baseball player. Size doesn't matter in baseball. Don't you believe it? Those big guys that they feed all those things to, those are the guys that come quack and they can knock that ball a long way. They got me up there one time. I made the team, and I was there because they had no cuts. And so, I, I mean, I, I was quick, and I could steal bases, and I could do all that stuff. But they put me on there, and they put me on the team, and they said, I didn't get the bat almost the whole season. I pinched ran a few times, but I didn't get the bat. And it came down to the, to the game when and everybody had played a little bit and the coach finally said, we need somebody else to pinch hit. Who hasn't batted yet? My hand went up and the coach said, who else hasn't batted yet? <laughs> and I raised my hand up and he said, all right, Greg, get in here. So I got up there and on the way up to the mound, he said, we, all we need you to do is get on base. He put his arm around me and he said, all you got to do is get on base. He said, I want you to get up there and crouch down as low as you can and make that pitcher have to throw to a strike zone that's so small he can't hit it. He said, I want you to get up there. And I, I would crouch down, but I, the only problem with it, I don't think I could get up if I did it. But I crouched down and I, had, I was so low and I, and, and I remember that. And, and, and that guy pitched it and the umpire called the first one. He said, ball. Then he called another ball. The pitcher figured out, he said, he's going to try to get a walk out of me. So he started throwing the ball, and he threw a strike one. Strike two. My coach said, go ahead and swing at the next one. I swung, and I missed it, and I missed it. He said, strike three, you're out. I remember throwing my bat down. I'll never be a baseball player. I hate this game. I walked off the mound, and my coach said, get him next time. My dad walked up, and he said, son, that was the best strike out of that game. 
He was my fan even when I couldn't do it. Even when I wasn't that good and I knew I wasn't that good, he was my number one fan. I'm going to tell you something. Your kids need you to be behind them and they need to know that you stand with them. And they need to know that you care and they're important enough that you will be a part of their life. It thrills children and grandchildren when grandparents show up school or their activities. They love it. My grandson was, we went, when we went back to Colorado, they were up there and, and they were in a, a baseball game. And the cool thing was, is the baseball game, they didn't keep score. Well, I thought that was the stupidest thing I ever heard of. And they would, and get this, nobody would strike out. You could stand up there until you hit the ball. And then, after you hit the ball, nine kids ran, or ten kids ran after that ball. All ten, they all run to one side, and, and this little kid kept running. And my grandson, when he got up there to hit, he walked up, and I was sitting over there, and it was hot, and the sun was beating down, and he, he walked by me, he goes, Papa, I'm getting ready to hit, watch me. And I was, I was so proud of him, and he wound up, and he hit that ball and knocked it out in the outfield. He took off running to first base, second base, third base, and caught home. He walked up, and he said, I told you I was good. <laughs> he believed it. Let me tell you something. It thrilled him. He said, thanks for coming to my game. That you make their day when you are their fan. Amen? You need to be their fan. You need to support them. Go ahead. Pull the next one up. Spend time with them. You can't be a part of their life. You can't be involved in their lives if you don't spend time with them. Now, when they're children, you can mandate that more. But when they get older, how many of you know your kids don't think you're cool? Unless they're wanting you to buy them something. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Parents are all smiling. The kids are saying, mm, no. If I want to get my son Joe out of his room, this is what I do. Joe, what do you want to eat? <laughs> or if, if I want him to go somewhere with me, I say, Joe, we're going to stop by the mall. What kind of, you want us to pick your clothes out? Man, he'll come out of his room in a hurry because he knows he don't want me picking out his clothes. <laughs> I'll tell you something. And I... I my son is, he's going to kill me off this one, Alexandra. He will kill me on this one. When it comes down to picking out clothes, grandparents, we're out of touch. <laughs> My mom said, what, does, what kind of clothes does Joey like? <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, don't you, Jay? He said, she, he said, I said, buy him a T-shirt. He likes any kind of T-shirt. Buy him a T-shirt. So... My mom went to the to mall, talked to the mall person. The mall person told Joey, "Get this is what you want for your grandson. Everybody's wearing them. He'll love it." So, Christmas came around. Joey opened the present. He opened it up and looked at it, and it says, "It's a T-shirt with a giant rainbow on it, and it says free to be." <laughs> Joey said. Dad, what is Grandma trying to say? <laughs> I said, Grandma doesn't know. <laughs> we don't, we're not in touch like we, we, we ought to be. So, so I, I, here's what I'm trying to say. If you want to really touch your children, be active in their life, be a part of their life, be involved in their life, do something with them. Find something that they like to do. My son Joey likes to fish. I, I am not a very good fisherman because I am not very patient, but I will go and sit with him for hours just to spend time with him. I will go and, and do things because I found something that he likes and, and I will tolerate. And so you, you find something to be involved with him. Every one of your kids need that. And sometimes you need to take time just to be with one at a time. Sometimes they just need to know that you care and you're there. Don't expect them to understand it if you're not. The Apostle Paul said this, and I want to ask you a couple questions after I say this. It says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. 
first in John the third chapter or third John the first chapter verse uh, one and I mean verse eleven it says beloved do not imitate what is evil but what is good he who does good is of God but he who does evil is not seen of God. When Paul quoted that scripture and he said, imitate me just as I imitate Christ, I ask you this question. Are your kids around you enough? Are they imitating you? Are they acting like you? Are they doing what you do? One of my favorite stories of that scripture was this. I was shoveling snow in Indiana and God delivered me from that evil of Indiana snowstorms, but... I never will forget one day we were shoveling snow and Joe wanted to come outside and see the snow and be in the snow. And the snow was tall enough that he could barely walk in it. It was almost as tall as he was. And he said, I said, Joe, if you'll walk in my footsteps, you'll make it through the snowstorm. You can walk in my footsteps. And I turned around and Joe's trying his best to walk in my footsteps and sometimes I wonder are we willing to say that to our children walk in my footsteps do what I do live like I do Charles Barkley one time he he was asked this by one of the announcers they said Charles what do you think about all the children that admire you as a basketball player he said I'm not anybody's idol nor do I want to be I don't want to be an example because I'm not a very good one the sad thing is, is that people look at you, and you may not want to be, but they are looking at how you live, and they are following your example. I want to move on. We must be involved in their life. Go ahead, pull that next one up, Robert. It says, discipline your children. Now, now kids, you might want to plug your ears in this. Parents, you might want to pay extra attention to write these scriptures down. I believe that discipline is something that's very necessary for our children to have a successful school year. I believe that discipline is very necessary. I believe the scripture that says that we should understand what it means to love our children and still yet discipline our children. We live in a world to where you, 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 you don't discipline them because you're going to curve their personality. You're doggone right. Some of these kids need their personality twisted. And I, I look at the world today that we live in, and, 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 and I, I was watching my, my granddaughter one day, and, and they said, now you need to sit down and be in time out. She mouthed off one time, and she mouthed off a second time. That's it! You're going to go and sit in the corner all by yourself. No electronic device. Oh, no, Mom, not that. If that would have been my day and I would have mouthed off once to my mom, I would have gotten my mouth smacked. If I'd have said it again, I'd have been chewing on soap for about two days. Discipline will not kill your children. It will guide them and direct them in the direction that they need to go. God loves you so much whom he loves he will chasten he will discipline you to bring you back where you need to be in your relationship with him and God loves you so much if you love your children don't be afraid to discipline them I, I, I was at Walmart one day and, and I saw a, a lady arguing with a three-year-old about whether the child was going to stay in the cart or not. And the kid won the argument because mom didn't want to deal with the issue of discipline. I remember one day my wife was in line and my son Brandon was about probably four maybe and he was throwing one of those little fits you guys never do that. But he was throwing one of them fits, you know, and he was, was acting up. And I remember my wife turned around and she spanked his legs and she said, you'll not act that way in public. And you'll not act that way. And she told him, like, and the lady goes, you shouldn't be hitting that child. So a lady behind my wife said that. My wife turned around and said, if you don't be quiet, I'm going to hit you. <laughs> 
Uh, I'll tell you, just leave my wife alone when she's doing stuff like that. But here's what I want you to understand. Discipline will not kill your children. The Bible tells you so. And listen, if you're taking notes, you need to write these scriptures down. I want to pull them up real quickly and I'll read them to you as we go. Proverbs 22nd chapter, verse 15. Notice all these will be in Proverbs. How wise the writings of Proverbs is. It says, Foolish, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. These are in the Bible if you'll read them. It says, he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Chasten your son while there is hope. And do not set your heart on his destruction. And one more. It says, do not withhold correction from your child. For if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. There was a time or two when I wondered if I was going to. But you shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. That last one is probably the one that, that it speaks to me the most. Because if you don't take time to discipline your children, crazy where I know what it, what it is. I can discipline and discipline measures change from child to child. They have to be disciplined. Uh, sometimes sometimes I, we've had in our home, and sometimes the only thing my mom from the back of the and if I'm, if I'm fiddling around, and my mom was a piano player, so she usually sat up towards the front. I was sitting in with my friends, and I, my mom would hear me. She would turn around, and she would say, I knew, buddy, I better straighten up in a hurry. That snap could be heard like echoes of a bullet coming out of a gun. Pow! She would snap that finger. When I, and then she would, when she did this, I knew I better come. That meant... I piddled around too much, and she got on to me. She got tired of it, and I had to go sit by her. And if I was still piddling, she had fingernails. And she would take fingernails and pinch me with them. And she, if it ever came to the point, she said, we're going to deal with this when we get home. Buddy, I knew my dad was going to get me then. I knew I had crossed the line. And I got home. I, a lot of times, you know, that, that idea, I never will forget one time when I had, I had done some things, and, I, and it's none of your business what I did. Don't, I'm not going to tell you everything I did. <laughs> My dad's on the bed, and he said, son, we're going to, it's going to hurt me more than it is you, but I need to spank you so you know that you can't do this. And I remember my dad looked over at me. He goes, it's going to hurt me more than it is you. And I said, this must be killing you because I know what's coming. <laughs> my dad spanked me, and he set me down. But it, you know what broke my heart the most? The, I could take the spankings. But when my dad said, son, I'm disappointed in you. I'm disappointed in the fact that the decision that you made. And when he said that, it just destroyed me. And I knew I didn't ever want to do that again. And so I would always think what I did because I didn't want to disappoint. When I, when I learned what my, the, the, to, to try to live by the example of what my father said, I knew I wanted to live to please. Not only that, but then... I also wanted to learn because my dad lived by one structure and that was to please the Lord God with all of his heart. And I wanted to learn to live just like that so I could live to please him. Amen. I want to, I'm just about finished. Alexander, why don't you go ahead and get the kids? She's running to get the kids. She's running to get the kids. Look at her run right now. The, the last thing that you can do for your kids and you should do with them every day is to pray for them. Pray for them. You need to pray for them, pray over them, and pray with them. They need to know that you are, you are there for them. They need to know that you care for them. You can do a lot of things for them and be, and be loving to them. But, but they need to know, you need to pray for them. And there's nothing wrong with you as a parent taking your child. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but pray over them out loud. Let them hear you pray. Let them hear you pray. Let them hear you pray because that gives them an opportunity to open it up. I don't care how old they get, they still love to hear you pray over them. 
Take time to say a word of prayer over your children and pray constantly. You need to pray for God to give you the wisdom to know how to feel, how hard to apply the rod. Amen? I mean, we live in a crazy world, and I never will forget when they were teaching us when our foster care license, and we, we were trying, to, and they said, you're, you're not allowed to spank your children. And I said, well, I, I, she said, you need to calm down before you do that so you, you don't spank them and hurt them. So what I did was, uh, this is, they would tell me to slow down and calm down, So because out of, you know, at the moment, you get kind of mad, you know? So they would say, okay, you need to count to 10. You know how fast you can count to 10? One, ten, pow! It's just part of the routine, you know? But, you know, so you got you to gotta understand that there is, there is a way to, to, to pray and to ask God to do it. Now, I asked Cindy. She's got back in the back. All you parents, you don't get to pick one of these up on your way out. But it's, a, it's a how to pray for your children as they go back to school. Pray over your children for God to protect them and guide them and direct them. To pray with them so that God would touch them and be with them. I want to I wanna share with you a couple of scriptures. But my main scripture is found in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Towards the end of after God tells them, you can put them up into all the, the armor of God and, and the, the helmet of salvation and pray over them and put them all wrapped up in, into all the, the armor of God. The last thing that Paul says is this right here. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, praying always with them, praying, praying for your children. You see, you can bundle them up. You can buy them school clothes. When I, uh, the other day, my wife went to the mall and bought Joey some school clothes and got him some new shoes and new clothes and and, and, and I said, son, are you going to wear your new clothes? And he said, no, I like my old ones better, but mom bought these for me, so we're going to wear these. So uh, all of this being said is here, here's what I'm telling you. You can spend a lot of money to try to make your kids happy. Bring them on in. Well, huh? Okay. You just ran so fast, you outran them all. Praying over your children is the most important thing you can do. When you think about your children... The best thing that they can do is hear your children. When we pray for a, 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 all the children as they go to school today, and we pray for them over their, 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 their day, over their school, because when they go to school, again, I've told you, this could be the last time that you see them. Come on, bring them up or just file along this line right here and just fill up this front end. We, can, we, we need to pray for our kids as they go to school. We need to pray for our teachers as they teach the kids in school. Come on and just line up across here, all the way across. Now this is, this is we're, we're going to dismiss, but I'm going to tell you something. We've got a lot of exciting things coming up with, with all of this next school year and all of that. When I was praying, that's what my picture in my mind was right there. Jesus is just with them every step of the way. Amen? Well listen, here's what I want you to do. Stand with me. You've been sitting for a little while. And what I want you to do is, now I know a few, a few folks had to leave, and I know it was a little bit long today, but I felt it important for every one of these kids to be prayed for, to know that, that God is with them. They're important to us. Amen? God is important to them. Amen? Let's pray. Let's close in prayer.